Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We have two wonderful poets with us today, Sandra McPherson and Pam Ward. Sandra will read first. Sandra McPherson wrote, quote, my 21st collection, the 5150 poems, was published by Nine Mile Books, New York State, in 2022. Among my previous books are Expectation Days, Illinois, The Spaces Between Birds, Mother-slash-Daughter Poems, 1967 to 1995, Wesleyan, and Streamers, Echo. A 22nd collection, Speech Crush, is forthcoming from Salmon Poetry Press in Ireland. I taught 23 years at the University of California, Davis, four years at U of Iowa Writers Workshop, and several years in Portland, Oregon, in informal workshops. I collected improvisational African-American quilts and donated 67 of them to UC Davis. I founded and edited Swan Scythe Press. I'm adopted and in my birth family is Plymouth feminist author, Abby Borton Diaz. My only child is on the autism spectrum. She is accomplished with a camera, end of quote. Sandra McPherson is a poignant, insightful, loving, compassionate poet. Here's the brilliant poet, Sandra McPherson. Thank you, Harry. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. It's so nice to meet you and the audience that's with you. I am reading from uh, an assisted living facility in Davis uh, with my technical good buddy here, Nancy McNeil, who has has uh, has been on the screen before and will help me if I need help. Um, I'm going to read from the 5150 poems, and it's an entire book about um, falling into a crisis, going into the um, uh, Sutter Psych Hospital for a month, and working my way out of it into a love of living, and uh, happy to be alive, um, and um, seeing how I did that and wanting to share that with other people. I would love for this book to become a friend to those of you who read it. I think it's a very healthy book. 5150 is a law in California where you can be involuntarily uh, locked <laughs> away for 72 hours. And I, that is how I ended up in the hospital. I received a phone call from the hospital. Uh, um, I was not ready for it. This was about 10 years ago. And here's a little verse about the phone ringing. We have a bed. Who's we? Oh, why was it said? What do you mean have? Tremulous, I should never have picked up the phone. May I describe my beds? Or can you just keep your bed? A couple more sections, I'll skip it and then uh, I was whisked away to the hospital, and uh, then I wrote this. In my case, I had no choice. They'd send police. I gripped their Reader's Digest condensed book of a bed. My limbs loosened a crumbly log fire, a thin gruel of a blanket flowed over me, snug as a Brussels divan in Pompeii. When I woke, fraught, I slippered to breakfast. Thank you. 
And breakfast was an awakening every day for me because I discovered I loved the other patients who were in there. And so what I'm going to read you next are portraits of those people uh, whom I loved and wanted to preserve as I remembered them in these individual portraits of them. Our first man was named Henry. And Henry was from the streets. And he prayed before his meals. He would pray and pray and pray. And finally he would eat, but he was so grateful that it was his prayer that touched me deeply. It's just called Henry praying. Keeping this chair beside him three times our day and at midnight when the cosmos reduces us to snacks and still he prays mercy on tiptoes trips into his ruthless world. He's formal, a stately murmurer with the longest band of gratitudes, even though he must be starved. And even though he's starving, he manages a stony ascending trail of thank goodness for this, thank heaven for that. S's whisper where teeth should be. No piped in music, palliative or reverent, mistimes Henry's peace. Before our viands, a hospital class act, roast au jus, not as tough to a springy knife as guys he knows from the street. Vegetables bright verde, blues swirled into yellows, squash in its home of amber rind, pallid glory of a baked underground staple. Eyelids down, ropey strands of gray, brown, gray hair, face washed with grace. Henry begins to eat, only after he spared nothing. I am full. I pray Henry wants my roll and milk and butter. That prayer is answered. I remain there with Henry's prayer in the air. Something fair has been given him. You, God, don't you dare walk out on Henry's prayer. Then there was a young man who had a condition that uh, drove him un uncomfortable in, this, in the world that he was in. He had lost his sense of smell. This condition is called anosmia. And he was just a young, um, I would say college age fellow and suffering because he could not t smell anything. So this is called, uh, I'm thinking of all the things that he could not smell. Mad boy in the odorscape. Odorscape is like a landscape full of aromas. New jar of honey, cat's territory. Fish guts under a pier. Clove, the jacks of spice. Salt air over the dunes. It can reach much further in. New leather shoes. 
French fries at the boardwalk. Hills of manure and barn of hay. Sourdough baking, but not for ourselves alone. The shoulders of a friend with no top lying in the sun. Wet wool, wet paint, pizza, vanilla, good skunky pot, wicked coffee. In the outside world, Dorothy walks by wearing Estee Lauder. Soap on someone in the snow. Daphne, Odora. Silver sperm like pitch around its tree. What a cat knows about catnip. See Valerie and missing them, not knowing what he missed, made him go mad. Orange tree in bloom, cedar, lumber, winter wood smoke, match head between thumb and index. If you could smell these things, you'd know who you are. I want to tell him. Since stripped, you can't. You've learned the nature of God, a God who turns up his nose. There was a, a lovely woman, a little bit younger than myself, named Cindy, who was recovering from um, cutting her own throat. And she was recovering. She wouldn't cover it up with a turtleneck. She was going to enter the world proud of who she was and had recovered from. This is for Cindy who cut her own throat. Uh, in, in writing this, I tried to figure out how much, what fragment of a mile a little baby rattlesnake would be. And I tried to do the math for that, do what I came up with, uh, I guess. It's for Cindy, who cut her own throat, you most reminded me of that young rattler mid-trail in the hills. It's lax but ready body, measuring three hundredths of a mile, I guessed. But barbed wire's lace is the more obvious likeness to your scars. The fashion of them, their short slashes crossing with the look of something costly. Still, a young snake's realistic. It will grow. The knife line, life drawing, will heal. You found a board and care. That took a while, but now it's responsible to safe keep and discharge you. You're scared, but better than when we met four weeks ago. Tall and beautiful, you show how thought has worn you. You will not wear a turtleneck. A paring knife of a ruffle will always show. And long necked, not like a snake, you're like a swan. A snake makes it under the wire. A swan swims, Cindy, in the blue holes of your eyes. Mm. There was a woman and her son 
um, arguing. Uh, she was, uh, she had, had colored some, uh, with Sharpie colored, what do you call, little um, drawings that, that she called her art. And he wanted her to throw this sheaf of them away. And she didn't want to because they represented her art. And that is what she had become, was an artist. It was proud of them. And this is called Class Art, Art Class. Uh, she is having um, an accident and we're sitting on a terrible orange urethane divan. <laughs> Um, but she is an artist nonetheless. Class art, art class. My place is on the washable marmalade urethane divan with her. Urine runny, pants wet artist yelling run on at her son. My art my art, I have to keep my art. She clasps the art of Chartres, honored with purple Sharpie, leaf edge, green, gold leaf, orange, yellow. Without caution, she's the shout. My art, my art, don't ask me not to use my mind. The way Stafford, mild as he presented, ended his poem with a girl breaking into jagged purple glass. Her hand hurts. In her grip, a sheaf of rose windows from art class. Don't ask me not to use my mind. That feels like taking away my art. Ornate tracery of psychotherapy grandeur, fragile, and exercised, died as light seeps through. Rose window, thou art sick. But aqua, keep running, and you won't get caught right away. A nurse arrives to steal a vial of blood. Which would you rather keep? Your art's carnelian or your blood's ruby. Uh, the next link is called Why I Won't Go Back to Hell. <laughs> and it's a list of re reasons not to go back to the hospital or to the hellish state of mind that I was in for um, a couple of years. And i be happy to tell you it has been sustained. <laughs> I'm quoting a poet, Kenneth McLean, who talking about a tendril, the growth, <clears throat> the growth, the smallest green tendril growing the mind has improvised its way to cross the rift, way to get on to the other side. And here is, begins the inventory. I've scuffed up the way back. I'm non-returnable goods. I'd rather have sand between my toes and crumbs of macadam. My tendril feels like a Japanese bridge. Suspension. I'm tickled by growing pains. Hell misrepresented its address. I trip on grapes sprouting up. There's no ivy in hell, even if you judge it as slick, glossy, arrogant. Jasmine tries a takeover. 
hell's, hell expels tendrils, but ends up missing them. Jasmine's coup will succeed. There's a tightrope walker using me. That's not flame down there. That's envy of, of Zauschneria from up here on the rim. I hold my psychotherapist safe by her delicate hands. The butterfly pea vine, the pipe vine swallowtail need me to stay up. I envy jazz, it's soloing. My brain can always use the passion flower. I really didn't settle into hell any more than airports. I moved out mentally, little by little. Boy, am I green. Hurricane Sandy with tendrils stretching from the mid-Atlantic to the Midwest is seen October 29th in a satellite image from NASA. Lay your finger here, touch there, and it's not so shaky a stretch because I've been given a guitar string to swing across. A tendril doesn't back paddle. A spider silk refuses to grace perdition. Hell has no fine branch-like terminations of perpetual neurons. It doesn't recognize my name or remember it, but tendril, trend tendrils write me tenderly and irreversibly in cursive. Last night, I was lying under the window and we had a rare phenomenon. We had thunder and lightning and a downpour. And I uh, flew to the computer to, to tell Harry, that maybe I won't have power tomorrow, you know? But I'm happy to say not only do we have that power, but it reminded me of the state of mind I was in when I wrote this final poem that uh, pulled me out of the uh, depths and up in, into a will to live. And partly from knowing all the lovely people in the hospital and especially uh, a roommate, the last roommate I had, whose name was Joanne. We didn't know each other's last names, so I want you to know that before I read the last section of, of this. It's, a, it's five little sections of, um, you don't know who you're going to get for a roommate, but I happened to get a gym uh, the last time. And I, asked her, we, we asked each other, I said, why, why are you here? She said, I attempted. She didn't say attempted what? That is the grammar these days. And it uh, startled me. And so Joanne attempting and myself who also attempted and those of us who came through our work through in this poem that's got Bach and NPR and lightning and thunder and uh, everything happening at once. Uh, clear sky over loose birches, head pillowed in the middle of Bach. A severe thunderstorm warning. Concerto number six. Get out of the water. If you hear thunder, lightning can strike 15 miles away. Placer County, El Dorado. 
Murray Pariah, Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. Get out of the lake and go inside a car or cabin where there's a radio for Bach to continue without warning, full tilt. Oh, I like being struck by Baroque din. I like being. My roommate, Sutter Syke, whose complete sentence in answer to why was I attempted is the brightest light assigned to me, not the one who cursed, fondled, purred, and petted yippers, the one who propped the white door open all night to the screams, not the one who slept off every day through spikes of weary, violent hair. I would give them names, daughters, but I was unable to write by hand or memory. That's why I was in this attempting roommate, the one attempting most to live. Cut unnecessary words, we thought together, not our wrist. Joanne, washing your hair twice daily, brushing out its jet facets, luscious as a suicide coke, with strains of chocolate, cherry syrup, and Yoshitoshi's Bijinga. I want to offer you sake. I want to be served. Beverage that sustained us girls in summer. You were the ward's best inpatient at volleyball. Athletic in embrace of your lover, nightly visiting. How you clasped, released, contorted, embroidered yourselves upon each other's leg. Less like the medieval love knot than two lotuses soaked roots, water lilies, so that impassioned you don't hear staff call code lavender. Stop it. Everyone's too interested. Such beauty roomy on that ugly orange vinyl couch. Two years, one room away from where they found me oversleeping on the shower floor. Through drought, there's clement music they're radioing, recovered from badly deteriorated parts. A motet chorus, but not as they'd asked us daily, hearing voices. And some hopped up Domenico Scarlatti, pair of sonnet, sonatas, reconstructed Handel Hornpipe, and Agnes Dei, as I remembered, Lady on Lady, Brum Brumel, Earthquake, Misa, one's own mass, an equally singular justification to go on breathing. Something in oneself become a convent choir of a hundred thirteenth century nuns swinging, jazzed, well, my mind was out of the room. The leafy wands kept swinging. All along them, little lives, moths, finches, more than clinging. No ECT. Yes, birches. Bach again. And triple violin concerto. And how can this occur all over? urgent machine voice and interception because the fire scorched earth no longer holds. Amador, Calavera, San Joaquin, Stanislas, Doppler radar flash flooding, grizzly flat, volcano, 
move away from recently burned areas. Oktoberfest radio mudslide warning in the middle of these strange duets of Johann Sebastian and the state. Awaken me, electrical, shocking. As when we told each other last names, are you Professor? Joanne said, my friends love you. Then I knew I was crazy from our hard twin beds, her Norco plus my Norco only canceled any instinct we might have had to die. Better to live and leave, live and leave checked out by getting out of Sutter sight. Keep up the interruption, delivery by lightning. Debris flow, move to higher ground now. Act quickly to protect your life. But thank you, Sandra. The lightning in your poems was your vulnerability and your honesty and your superb writing. You touched me deeply and I love your empathy. And as we all know, vulnerability is important in each one of us who are poets. And you know, you it's revelatory. And I I just sit here and I'm grateful to you for your wonderful poetry and your wonderful sense of compassion. So thank you, Sandra. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, thank you very much, Sandra McPherson. Thank you. Our next poet is Pam Ward. L.A. native Pam Ward recently released her poetry book, Between Good Men and No Man at All, World Stage Press. Author of two novels, Want Some, Get Some, and Bad Girls Burn Slow, Kensington Press. Pam is a UCLA graduate, a recipient of a California Arts Council Fellow, and a Pushcart Poetry nominee. Pam edited the first anthology of Los Angeles Black women poets entitled The Super Girls Handbook. Operating a design studio and teaching at Art Center College of Design, Pam merged writing and graphics to produce My Life LA, documenting Black Angelinos in poster stories. Pam has published in Chiron, Calix, Abernathy, Voices of Lemert Park, and the LA Times. Her literary showcase, I Didn't Survive Slavery for This, was a multimedia poetic rip on life post-emancipation. Pam Designs runs a community imprint, Short Dress Press. She just finished her third novel, Bury My Dress on Central Avenue, a cocktail and jazz infused drama about a black actress vying for the top in her dalliance with a doctor, the prime suspect in the Black Dahlia murder, a crime so horrific, California closed its border. Pam Ward sings in her poetry, She's authentic, personal, and radiant. A magnificent poet, Pam Ward. Now, Harry, you added on that bio. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. That's so funny. That's, I, people, people hear that and think they're going to really get something. <laughs> All right. Um, this is called Stella on Friday. But first, I want to say thank you, Sandra, for your poetry. I really appreciate that. And you teach at one of the most reputable schools or taught of writing the Iowa. I mean, that's like, you know, the Holy Grail. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is Stella on Friday, soon to be published in an anthology called The Beat Goes On. She was walking fast, fast, fast. Boom, shaka booty, doing 50 down the concrete. Stepping quick in a halter and tangerine skirt. She was hurting them clothes. Hemline held on for dear life. Brake slam, pinstripe. Oh, men began to choke. The bus driver sat and made everyone late. 
couldn't take his eyes off that magnificent boom snap, boom snap, busting out at the seams, stereos tuned to that thousand watt strut. See, when Stella walked by, when Stella's heels slapped the street, down the block, down to Nick's, down to get her month to month cash, walking fast, 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 big size 12 shoved in some peekaboo shoes. Rayon Braille reading ass. See, when Stella walked through, men thought of holiday food, ham hocks, huge plates of glistening lambs, rice sleeping under some rich smothered chops, plenty of piping hot rolls. See, when Stella strolled by, it was 4th of July. She had firecracked thighs and some cherry bombs, too. And that booty, that rumba, but directing traffic. Feet, two strong drill bits just busting up street. Hips waxing over the crosswalking lines. She walked fast. She walked strong. Had a serious purpose. And her eyes never strayed from the check cashing sign when Stella stepped up. From the curb. Thank you. So my next piece is called, what is it called? How about coffee at 3 a.m.? Ooh, Puerto Rican man, I am watching you over my wet, swollen mug, long covert looks in the oblong mirror, Row after row of sad hollow cakes, whole trays of sectioned off melons. Here in this 40 watt den of chewed menus, the cafe of eternal pours. Ooh, Puerto Rican man, I don't know your language, my Spanish no good, and it spins like a peso on West LA streets. But we speak the soft swirling rhythm of spoons, the all-knowing soft list of napkins. My sweet Puerto Rican man, you cut me in half with those hungry black eyes and your way too tight jeans where your name sleeps inside of a hot melted wallet and I watch you. I watch your smooth overwork arms and that snug aqua tank. I watch as my knife aches, my fork makes the last final jab and my heartbeat is melting the butter. Ay, 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 Puerto Rican man, you cut me this time. My eyelids are freezing the ink on this page and I only look up when a hand comes, lingers a moment pours me some more, and I thank it. I stir as my spoon tings the edge, and I swallow the warmth of it slow. Thank you. Some of those poems are based on true stories. I used to write late at night at this cafe called the Beverly Hills Cafe. I loved it because it was open till three in the morning. So uh, here's a little thing. How about something called the will to live? Sandra was talking about life and, and, you know, coming close to that edge. So a lot of us have experienced that near death moment, but we're here. The will to live. September 11th was my ex's birthday. Brother was a bomb scare too. He moved me from half sleep to full terrorist alert, turned our home into a battle zone of rip close and smash plates. But I made it through okay. Got me a bulletproof vest and a car alarm out of there. Not trying to be glib to the folks back east, but real peace starts in your living room, y'all. From your driveway to your back porch. So don't be driving through LA with your red, white, and blue beating Mexicans looking Bin Laden to you, bombing moss, all white singing, oh say, can you see, thinking you got a hall pass to hate. Y'all kill me with your $5 patriotism scattered over these streets. The KKK waved their Confederates too from the back seat right next to their shotguns. 
Same kind I cocked at my ex late that night when we both learned about war and the art of living through hate, surrendering to our own ways. I ain't trying to be anti, but don't be waving your flag and be beating your wife. Don't be standing on streets talking about being a hero when your ass is wrecking havoc at home. This ain't about war anymore anyway. It's more like standing for something you can bite in and taste, believing in something beyond bombshells and graves, sucking hot fuel from a woman with nothing but heart and a hell of a strong will to live. Thank you very much. And now we shall enter the car. I'm an Angelino. We live so much in our car, racing, chasing, observing. My father would start our weekends in our VW van just driving through LA. He was an architect, so he was pointing out the sites and buildings. And there were six of us. And I used to wonder, well, when is he going to stop to get us something to eat? There was no stop to eat. We just were there to observe and then we went home. <laughs> but anyway. Here we go. The chase. I loved it when he let me drive, flooring it, honking, revving at stop signs, daring to find crazies to race with. It really pissed him off. He could never chill and just cruise. Had to act like some driver ed teacher. Now slow in that turn. You know that's our exit. Calm down. You don't have to drive childish. Rule after rule, like I don't know roads, like I can't see streets, like we'd end in the boondocks or something. Always backseat driving, nail biting, blabbing about some crap I didn't do right, and don't get in no fights. One time these cornfreds cut me off in Orange County, chased our ass all the way to Riverside. Me yelling, fuck you, you ignorant pricks, waving my Toys R Us pistol. Back and forth, zagging in and out traffic. The big one is clutching a mallet. Boyfriend just freaked when he saw that. Now see what you did, you dr no driving fool. Those assholes are going to kill us. I downshift to first, watched them fly past the window. I blew kisses, then yelled out, you dumb fucks. We got off the ramp, but they followed us up. Me screaming, come get me, don't make me get out. I got something here for your ass. Stabbing my black plastic gun in one's face, jabbing the other the finger. Big one leaped out when we got to the light, pounding wild like some maniac landlord, yanking the latch, kicking the fender, calling me all kinds of bitches. I drove 15 odd miles before they finally gave up. Lane changing, boyfriend just yapped the whole way, called me everything, every damn name in the book. We were way the heck out in the boondocks. So yeah, another little mini true story, some elements of truth in there. What else do we have on the table? Um, people are kind of really going through bad times now, the economy is shifting. And I think it's a time to really like be friendly, um, be generous with people you see on the street, you know, just try to help. If you really want to find out how to be happy, help somebody else. This is called poor reception. Before life became static, before TV sets that never turned off, before Jim Beam nights with the six o'clock news, you snoozing off with the sports pads, the what ads asleep in your lap while your shot glass stayed wide awake. Before layoffs and cutbacks and nine to five clean shaven days became beers before your uniform turned to pajamas, where you sat in dim rooms with a full concrete view of the broken glass still life of alleys, where your kids blistered, wearing their way too small shoes, the food stamps that came, but just never quite made it. And it all made you just wanna drink yourself blind. Before then, when you worked, way before all the storms, 
when the whole world was warm and felt summertime good and Friday's paycheck felt like God. And your pockets had dreams that could cha-cha at night and life never blurred or got fuzzy from static. Back then, the reception was good. Thank you very much. Shall we go on? Why not? How about a dog barks in winter? It's three o'clock now and the mailman ain't here yet. I wait and listen for jangling gates and old pissed off dogs barks ricocheting off porches. It's three o'clock now and the California palm looks so burnt in December. The hot powder sand has gone cold, gotten rough. The wind blows a Frito-Lay bag toward my door. It's three o'clock now, and the mailman ain't here. The neighbors sort trash, a pickup goes by, flies rub their hands in my coffee. The young finch of spring have grown up and flown, and the freeze makes me close all my windows. Why do they leave before it gets cold? Their song like a record that someone snatched off? and my radio can't get the station. Why do they leave right before it hits winter? Like a lover who wakes up to go find a match, walks off and never comes back. It's three o'clock now and my mailman ain't here. And I see no sign of his white midget truck or his blue felt tip pants, feet matching name after name after name past dues and big stacks of dull, ugly bills, millions of bright, useless coupons. It's three o'clock now, and it's cold here outside, but I wait for him day after day after day. I wait for him just like I wait for this check or my doorbell to ring or my phone's final song. Like I bone, I sit, although the sun is half gone, and my box is still hollow, and my dog hasn't been home in years. Thank you very much. I used to really like watching the mailman. I had a picture window, and so I would just watch the activities. And, and so that poem was based on just observing his stroll. And people, you know, the desperation and the wait for what, for what he had. Cats and dogs. It's not how he touched her, sucking her raw with the sloppy wet gusto of puppies. Teeth wildly listing each thing in her lobe that his body had already thought of. Nailing her wrist down as if she were Jesus. My God, how his thighs went to work. But it's not how he touched. It was more what she thought of. Train wrecks and cat fights, gunshots and riots, men drilling holes while you're stuck at the light, the skid marks you see on the center divide, how margarine slides on hot knives. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll read one or two more, and I think that's enough. <laughs> so, um, what shall I say? This is called The Loser. Another little true story. I changed the name of the club, but I just like the sound of this club. So even though it's a, a famous bar in L.A., I threw it in my poem and turned it into a motel. The first time I thought I was going to do it was at the Cockatoo Inn. This cheap hour rate dive on a red spandex street. It was cold. I was nervous. Chewed gum while he paid, hid my face in the moon of his afro. I was fully made up and got totally naked, but just couldn't go all the way. I don't know why, and he didn't press it. I really wasn't a tease. But the blankets were orange and our skin just as loud, and the radio sounded like traffic. So we rolled around both of our heads a sad mess 
pressing mouths until I told them, let's go now. I always remember I left my hairbrush there. It was nothing big, just a $2 pink handled brush laying raw, bristles scraping the table. I remember wanting to go there, back to that very room, even years later thinking I'd get it. Because even if it wasn't the brush, are really my first time. Something stayed behind in that room that I lost and I never got back. Okay, let's say that we shall end on sneaking home because it's just so much fun. I hope women are out there sneaking home right now and that they continue to do it. One time I had to get out, I mean out, God damn it. no more sneaking in the door, easing through the creep, tipping past your back, all hugged up on the blue glow of the TV. Or worse, you cursing my face on the front porch before I even hit the door, where all the peeking from the curtain neighbors could see, cheap wine in your teeth, bleeding my name, insanity soaked in your eyes. No, honey, not this time. This time I had my plans made, made a friend lie saying I was at her place away from your boozy mouth hollering cheap slut skank ho. No, this time my purse was packed with cute panties, toothpaste, skimpy nighted awake in. And when the sun hit my face, I set my hair in fat rollers, tied a bandana, tied my chucks and some sweats got dropped round the block like I woke and went running. And as I jogged up, you were there hosing grass. So I grinned, trying to sound winded when I yelled out, hey, daddy. Thank you so much, Harry, for hosting this great reading and for inviting me back again. I hope they're not bored, but I appreciate you keeping poetry alive. You've kept it alive in this community for so long and we just need you. Why don't you close out with a poem? Harry, we need one from you. Come on. <laughs> well, I, I'll read a poem, but I'll, before I read a poem, I will just say that I always love your poetry. You, It's so bright and vibrant and celebratory, and, and you, you're, fab, you're such a fabulous writer, and you have such a superlative use of language, and you're a great storyteller. And even <laughs> your asides, even your asides sing you know, when you said, if you're really trying to be happy, help someone. <laughs> you know, I believe that. I think that's true. But, yeah. um, you know, what, I, what I'm what i really interested, I'll read a poem of mine. But first, I would just like to say, could you just talk about, because I've known you for quite a few years, and you just seem such a natural writer. Uh, how did you get into the literary world? Well, it was from my mother's pantyhose pack. There was a perfectly white piece of paper that came out of that. It was cardboard. And I was like, oh, wow, this is wonderful. I can make greeting cards out of this. So I would fold it in half. I was probably like eight or nine. And I would write little poems, little Hallmark card kind of greetings. And then I would draw a picture in the front. And so I would give those to people. And then one day I said, I found a like a stack of notebook paper and I fold it in half. I might've been nine or 10 then. And I said, well, I'm going to write a novel now. And I wrote a novel called upside down town about these people that walked on their hands. So I don't know. I used, I lived about three blocks from a library and I was always in it and reading and, you know, people would say, come outside. And I'm like, Oh no, but this part is so good. So, so I was in and out, you know, my mother worked, my dad worked, and so I had a lot of freedom to just float around the city. And I would spend a lot of time just observing and writing. Not only that, I was later bused, not on a school bus, but my mother bought us a bus pass. And, you know, we went to school in West L.A. and lived in like South Central. So it's like several buses and you're, you know, it's a lot of people watching. <laughs> and how old were you when you got that, you found that little thing that you wrote from your mama's pantyhose were you oh I was probably about eight years old you know I was really young my dad was an artist and an architect so so paper and pens and writing and drawing was always something that I saw in my home because even when he wasn't doing architecture 
he was sketching on napkins and pads and drawing little sayings, like almost like creating cartoons. And so I just mimicked that and, and I didn't really draw a lot. I actually became a graphic designer, still run a graphic design business, but the writing part um, came really to, I would have to credit Michelle Clinton and Wanda Coleman for, for showing me a place called Beyond Baroque. And I took a poetry class there. And that's when I really started writing. I saw an ad for Caffeine Magazine looking for poets. So I sent them some stuff. And I think that's what people should also do. You know, I mean, besides just always submitting stuff, that you should invite yourself to poetry readings. If you're not invited to a poetry reading, just show up and see if you can kind of finagle your way in. I did that for years. So people are like, oh man, Pam, how'd you get this reading and that reading? I'm like, I, you know, throwing elbows. I bogarted. (laughs) You have space for one more, you know, I mean, just, just be bold and, and keep writing. And if you have something to say, people, people want to hear you. Well, you're the voice of L.A. to me. You always say, I love your poetry. And I will, you know, I will read a poem. It's from my last book, uh, Love Poem to MPTF. I will find you. I will find you behind a tree. I will find you in a bouquet of flowers. I will find you in a cup of coffee, in a book of pastoral poetry, in an absent love, in a sorrowful friend, in a narcissistic friend. I will find you in an evening sunset, in a shady nook where I practice cornet, in a friend with a terminal illness, in a home without a wife, in a wife who's coming home. Mm. I will find you in a leafless sycamore, in a rabbit, squirrel, hawk, egret. I will find you in a journey home, in a friend's compassion, at a table with a poetry book. I will find you in a photo, an email reply, in a forgiving heart, in a gracious, generous act, I will find you within. So thank you for asking. Wow, that's so good. It reminds me of that little short story about the little rabbit and that's going to run away from home. And then the mother's (laughs) like, if you go, I will find you. I love that line. Well, you know. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned Michelle Clinton. I always loved her, her poem about toast. And in the poem about toast, she said, if you want toast just the way you like it you got to make it yourself but <laughs> and she was sure. great and uh here's here's jennifer Clymer. but before i uh turn this over to jennifer I, she always loves your poetry as i do too thank you pam you're a you're a wonderful original poet and anytime you want to come back we're always happy to have you so you're a blessing to us and to all of la and thank you and here's jennifer let me just say real quick We lost one poet, Linda Albertano, and I just want to dedicate this entire reading to her. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Really powerful. The the Toucan Motel, I can see it. I I was there, and I'm sorry you lost your brush. (laughs) How old were you? Oh, God. Um, Maybe 16, 17. You know, I really thought that was going to be the night, but the guy just wasn't doing it for me, so it didn't happen. <laughs> you did it for us. <laughs> um, so, Harry, before we let you go, tell us what's on uh, tap for next week. What's in store? Next week, we have two wonderful poets, Tony Barnstone and Mary Fitzpatrick will read their terrific poetry. Wonderful. And Pam, what are you up to next? Where Where is the next place people can catch you? I don't know, but they can always get the book Between Good Men and No Man at All. Um, where am I reading next? Oh, I just did a great reading for um, keeping abortion legal for L.A. at Beyond Baroque. And I don't know. I can't. It's something in October, but I can't think of now. <laughs> let Harry know. Harry will let us know. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. All Thank right. you so much, Jennifer. Bye.